Tonight we're in uh, Genesis chapter 27. If you guys can make your way there. I see a couple new faces. Um, just to give you um, some info on the difference between the Wednesday night um, message and the Sunday night message. Uh, Wednesday night, we... Um, we dedicate some time after the message to uh, fellowship, so we gather, we split up into groups, and we have a couple questions up here on the screens, and so you can discuss and get feedback. They're all pertaining to the same message. They're application questions, so please don't, I mean, if, if the message is over and you want to walk out, you can walk out if you want, but the rest of you, you know, if you want to hang out and uh, talk about the message, by all means. Uh, so we're in Genesis chapter 27. Last week's uh, passage, chapter 26, we saw uh, the Lord uh, working in Isaac's life. I think the Lord was building Isaac's faith up. We see that there was a famine in the land. And Isaac, I think Isaac was on his way to Egypt. Okay, just like his father previously, almost about close to 100 years before, his father during a famine, he ran off to, to escape the trial. He ran, he ran down to, to Egypt which is a picture of the world. Egypt in the Bible is always a picture of, of, the, of the world. And uh, we see that Ishmael is headed there as well. Um, or else, why did, why did the Lord tell him, hey, Ishmael, don't go into Egypt. So join in the land. Stay in the land. The Lord tells him to dwell in the land. So he stays there. He sort of stays there in a border town of Gerar. And we have this other guy named Abimelech. Not the same Abimelech that Abraham had dealt with previously. The Abimelech is a title like, like Pharaoh sort of like a synonym for king. He was just a ruler of the, at the time there in, uh, of the Philistines. So we see that Isaac gets caught up in a lie. His wife is also beautiful, just like uh, his mother, Sarah, was. So what, um, what Isaac does there is he lies. He lies. He says, well, this is my sister, except it wasn't, his, it wasn't even his half-sister like, like uh, Abraham and Sarah. He lies to protect his own self. To protect his own life. And that's actually, we talked about how that was the opposite of how Christ calls husbands in the New Testament to love our wives. Because we are to die for our wives, right? We are to love, love them sacrificially as Christ uh, loved the church and he gave himself for her. And then we see that uh, after he gets caught up in this lie, Abimelech catches him. Uh, the, the King James uses the word uh, sporting. They were playing some, some kind of game that you don't play with your sister. Um, they were uh, probably, it was probably some, some physical caress and all that. Um, well, we see that uh, Abimelech calls Isaac over and he says, hey, you know, what, what are you doing to us? And then he gets caught up in that and, and Isaac confesses and then we see the Lord bless him a hundredfold and, and Isaac is prospering there and the, uh, uh, the Philistines there, the people there, they start sort of getting envious and they're like, this guy's, you know, he's, he's, he's getting too much land, he's getting too much profit here. So what do they do? They shut his water off, they, you know, plug up the wells and he has to move uh, westward, and he, he finds a well. I think the first well he finds means quarreling. And, and the, the people there, the valley there, they plug up that well as well. They shut the water off there. So he continues to move. He finds another well. And I think that well, uh, they named that well contention because there was contention with the people there as well. What does he do? He keeps moving westward until finally he gets to the place, the same place where his father Abraham had also made an oath with the previous Abimelech. And the Lord blessed him there. The Lord has spoke to him there. And I think he named that well spaciousness because there was finally room enough there for him to live with his neighbors. And that's where he stayed. That's where we left off in chapter 26. I was trying to apply this to my life. I was like, Lord, because, you know, in, in our house, I've been living in our house since uh, my son was born, junior, he's nine. So we're, we're going to be there for about a decade now, for 10 years. And, um, and you know, it, it, it's... Uh, it's a little bit of a, a smaller house, and, and it's fine for us. It, it's, it's just the right fit. But we got a new baby, right? So we got to put in baby stuff in the house, and it gets kind of cramped. It gets kind of contentious. It gets kind of uh, quarreling sometimes because, though the baby's there, and I'm trying to go around, and, and I'm, Lord, are you speaking to me? Or are you trying to tell me that we're going to get a more spacious house pretty soon? And, you know, uh, that'd be pretty neat. But, um, you know, that's what we want to do today. We want to look at the text and see how it applies to our lives. Because there's over 40 verses tonight, we're just going to read it through, uh, talk a little bit briefly about certain specific things that pop out, and then at the end of the chapter, we'll look at the application. We're going to look at this family. We're going to look at Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, and Esau, and we're going to, we're going to learn from what not to do, because this was a kind of a, you know, a home that was divided. 
And we all know homes that were divided. We probably came out of a divided home. And, you know, I, I've seen them before where, you know, maybe, for example, where, where the husband is not taking the, the, the leading role. He doesn't seek God for, uh, for the decisions of the household, for the decisions regarding his children and his wife. You know, maybe, uh, maybe a house where, where the, the, the wife is having to lead or having to, uh, you know, do things behind her husband's back to get things done right or whatnot, and where the, ch- the house is divided, the children are divided, and, you know, they don't talk to each other or whatnot. I think we're all familiar with divided homes. And this is basically a chapter about a family that was divided, unfortunately, but we should learn from them, and, and we should learn what not to do. So let's bow our heads in a word of prayer and begin this message. Lord, Father God, we pray, Lord, that you would uh, help us to understand your word. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to us, Lord, that you would uh, challenge us this uh, evening, Lord, that you would comfort us, Lord, that uh, you would fill us with your spirit, Lord. We pray for the protection of the children in the, uh, in the children's ministry over here, Lord. We pray for the protection of, uh, of our youth over here, Lord, and we pray for the protection of this place where we're at now, and uh, we just pray, Lord, that you would uh, speak to us tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So let's begin here in verse 1 of chapter 27. And I have a small outline up here. The first four verses, we're going to look at Isaac. It says here, now it came to pass, this was quite a few years since chapter 26. It says it came to pass when Isaac was old. When Isaac was old, some believe he was 137 years old, the same age Ishmael was when he died. It says his eyes were so dim that he could not see. One translation says he he could uh, barely see. He was nearly blind. What does he do? It says that he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son. And he answered him, Here I am. Then he said, Behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. In other words, he's telling him, I might die any day now. I'm pretty old. What he didn't know is that he was going to live for, uh, I think, till 180 years old. He still, had, he still got a, had a good amount of years in him. Maybe he was thinking, well, you got Ishmael over here. He died at 137. I'm already 137. Uh, maybe I'm going to die pretty soon. So he was, starting to, he was starting to plan here. Again, he tells him, he says, I'm old. I don't know the day of my death. Now, therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me. You probably wanted some venison. He had a favorite dish here, as we're about to see. He says, and make me savory food, such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. When I was studying this, uh, this chapter, I noticed that the words savory food are found six times. Savory food is found six times here. So this passage really has to do somewhat, has to do somewhat with food. And it's interesting because Esau was deceived with the, you know, well, I don't want to say he was deceived, but because he sold his own birthright. But there was, Jacob used... You know, a, a stew of lentils there. That's some, you know, somebody believes it was, it was a bowl of chili because it was red. Whatever it was, uh, now we're going to see again that there's uh, a savory food involved in this chapter as well to reach not Esau, but his father Isaac. He also loved food. Now look at Rebekah now in verses 5 to 17. It says, now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. Might have had a habit of eavesdropping here. It says, and Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. So what does Rebekah do? So Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make, again, second time, savory food for me that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. Now, she says this quite a, quite a few times. She says, obey my voice. Keep that in mind. That's significant to the text. Obey my voice according to what I command you. Now, we see Rebecca here. She was eavesdropping. She's um, plotting. She's taking things into her own hands. We had read uh, previously about two, three chapters back um, when uh, Rebecca was, uh, was pregnant. She was pregnant with, with twins. There was turmoil inside of her. What does she do? She prays. And the Lord tells her, there's two nations inside of you. And they were fighting against each other. They were uh, quarreling. And then we see as she prays, the Lord answers her. He tells her that the older, 
the older son, that is the firstborn, will serve the younger. That is, he was to get the blessing. And I think Rebecca knew this all along, and I don't see why um, Isaac didn't know this. I mean, I, I believe that, I mean, if my wife, if the Lord spoke to my wife, I believe my wife would tell her, and vi- tell me, and, and vice versa, I would tell her how the Lord speaks to me. But she knew the blessing was to go to Jacob, but we see Isaac here acting, uh, you know, he wants to bless his favorite son. See, that's a problem. They had favorites as well. Uh, uh, Isaac favored Esau because, well, he hunted, you know, could be, he favored him because of what he did for him. He hunted, you know, a uh, game here, and he was blessed through that. So she's plotting here in verse 7. She's, she's reciting what the father says. She says in verse 7 again, bring me game and make savory food for me that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, and I will make savory food from them for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father that he may eat it and that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth-skinned man. And we've talked about how probably, you know, Esau, he probably had his, you know, Doug Dynasty uh, beard going on. And uh, he, he was a hairy guy. And his brother was the opposite. He probably didn't have any facial hair. He was probably like David when, when he initially was anointed and called. But he, these are normal concerns. He, doesn't, he obviously does not want to get caught up in this, this, this plotting, this deceitfulness. What does it say here? In verse 10, Then you shall take it to your father, and he may eat, and that he may bless you before his death. And his concern is that his brother is hairy, and he is not. Perhaps my father will feel, uh, will feel me, he says, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him. Keep that in mind. We're going to talk about that in a bit. Right there where he says, I shall seem to be a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, Let your, your curse be on me, my son, only, again, obey my voice and go get them for me. So she was willing to take the blame in th- if things went uh, sour here. And he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the choice clothes of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house. She probably was rummaging through the dirty laundry there so she can get a pretty smelly uh, uh, clothing from her older son there so she can give it. So, you know, Jacob can wear it. It says here, And put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. Then she gave the savory food and the bread, which she had prepared into the hand of her son, Jacob. So we see, as we continue reading, she's plotting. She's got a plan. She's a woman with a plan, and she's got her son involved as well. Verses 18 to 29, deal with Jacob. It says, so he went to his father and said, my father, and he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. Let's see if you can count the lies with me. That's the first lie right there. I'm Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. He says of my game. He, He wasn't really out there catching anything. I mean, he went into the... Uh, right there where, the, where they had the goats. Verse 20, But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Notice the third lie, how he involves the Lord now, Because the Lord your God brought it to me. Verse 21, Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. And, and we can tell he was growing suspicious. We know that he was, you know, I think he was going blind, but he was also grow, going uh, growing suspicious here as well. And, and I think it was because of the voice. That's probably the only thing he couldn't really uh, get right. He says in verse 22, So Jacob went near to Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. Then he said, Are you really my son Esau? He said, I am. Again, the fourth lie. Just a repetition of the first. He says in verse 25, Bring it near 
to me, and I will eat of the, my son's game, so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate, and he brought him wine, and he drank. So everything was deceptive right down to the very goat. It wasn't venison. It was actually a goat pretty well prepared. That it, you know, it was comparable to venison, I guess, is why is not only was Jacob a good cook, but, you know, uh, Rebecca was a good cook. He probably learned from her. But even everything was deceptive about this down to the, the animal, the goat. And it's interesting because if you fast forward a couple chapters, Jacob himself would be deceived by also a goat or the blood of a goat, a kid there, when we, we, his brothers actually plot. Joseph's brothers actually plot against him. They take his coat of many colors. They put blood of, of, of a kid there, of a goat, and they bring it back to dad. They sell him to the Ishmaelites, distant relatives, into slavery. They bring that coat of many colors stained with blood to his father, and they say, you know, he was killed by a wild animal. And see, we see Jacob himself being deceived by a goat by, uh, to a certain sense in the future, and we see the pain that he has as well. He's also deceived the previous time by Laban, his uncle, and he's got to work for his wives there. Verse 26 says, Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near now and kiss me, my son. Now the kisses back in the ancient, um, the ancient uh, Middle East, they, they were sort of like, a, how can I put it? Whenever you had an oath or a contract, this was something that sealed the deal. And he wanted the, the, the kiss here, my son. And he says in verse 27, And he came near and, and kissed him. And as, and as I'm reading this, verse 26 and 27 I'm thinking of, of Judas, right? Because Judas is the guy that is known for the, the, the betrayer's kiss. But notice he's using his other sense, his sense of smell. And he says, And he smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him and said, Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, and he's, a, he's blessing him now, Therefore may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. And think of the three P's here. Providence, right off the bat, he's blessing him with providence. Verse 29, let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. And right there, I think it speaks of power. He had authority, the nation of Israel. It says, cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be those who bless you. And we see that, and a lot of this was a re recital of, of the blessings, of the promises to Abraham from God. But we see the third P here, and we see it as protection, right? Let's continue, verse 30. Now we're going to talk about Esau. What happens? It says, now it happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had, notice, scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father. So as soon as he left, what happens? that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also had made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that your soul may bless me. He didn't know that his father was already full. He didn't want seconds. It says in verse 32, And his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? So he said, I'm your son, your firstborn Esau. Notice this, verse 33, Then Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who? Another translation said, says he trembled violently or uncontrollably. It's hard to imagine. I was imagining like a stroke or something or seizure. It says here, where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came and I have blessed him and I indeed, and indeed he shall be blessed. So there was no exceptions. Once the blessing was given, there, there was no seconds, you know, no, no refunds. I can't take it back anymore. Right? Everything was final. All, all, all things were final. And, and this was something serious. This was something very true. Very uh, definitive. Verse 34, Esau's reaction. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried. Notice the strong emotion here. He cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry. And said to his father, bless me, bless me also, O oh, my father. But he said, your brother came with the seed and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. Notice that, that, that was sort of a, 
That's partially true. I mean, he didn't take away his birthright. He sold it to him. And now look, he has taken away my blessing. Then again, was it really his blessing? The Lord had already chosen even before, you know, they, they were born. The Lord had chosen. Romans talks about this. Our Lord had chosen. And he allowed, he, you know, he even told his mother this. The older shall serve the younger. But we see that Isaac here was acting contrary to God's word. So the, I think both of them are pretty upset, but not as upset as, as Esau here. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Is there, is there seconds for me? Is there anything else I can get? I'll take whatever I can get, basically. Verse 37, then Isaac answered and said to Esau, indeed I have made him your master and all his brethren I have given him to him as servants with grain and wine. I have sustained him and what shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. So he's still crying here. Some scholars believe that he was up in his 70s. Okay? He wasn't, uh, sometimes you imagine him as a you know, young I don't know, teenager, but he was, and he, were, these were grown men here. And he's crying. It says, Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, and this is sort of like a blessing, I, I believe, but it's more of a prophetic word. Behold, your dwelling shall be notice of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. Now, right there, the word of can also be rendered away if you have a different translation than the King James or the New King James. It's not, a, it's not necessarily a positive thing here. It's not saying that he's going to be blessed with the fatness of the earth. He says in verse 40, By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother, and it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. So let's stop there for a minute in verse 40. There. The descendants, the nation that came from Esau are the Edomites. And the Edomites were under subjection to the Israelites for a long time. There was a time that, where they rebelled. You should read the book of Obadiah if you haven't. Uh, I, I know I taught it uh, early on when I started Preaching on Wednesday nights, Obadiah was one of the first uh, books I taught when we were going through the, the minor prophets. And it really emphasizes a lot on the Edomite, Edomites and, and, and all they did, how they went against the Israelites. You know, when Babylon came to take over Judah, the, the Israelites, they tried to get away, try to flee. They tried to go through the Edomite line. The Edomites captured them and returned them back to the Babylonians. They, you know, they, they were really, you know, uh, wicked people. And we see that Idumea... The Idumenians are also Edomites. And it's interesting because in the future, fast forward to, to uh, the, right before Jesus is born, we see Herod the Great. He was an Idumean, again, coming from the Edomites. And what does he do when he hears about this newborn king or this king coming into the scene? You know, he gets paranoid. He was paranoid. He even killed some of his own children and his wives. He was paranoid. He, he thought somebody wanted to dethrone him. And he would do whatever he had to to uh, remain king. And he hears about Jesus. And what does he do? He kills the innocent. They refer to it as, as a murder of the innocents, the killing of the innocents. He kills all, a lot of uh, all the, the, the Jewish baby boys. Not to take anything away from uh, Stephen, the first martyr, but really these babies can somewhat be the, the first martyrs in the sense because, to a certain sense, because they died because of Jesus. But see, we see that that Herod was also part of the Edomites, and there's all, there's all this significance here, and when we see what happens when people don't obey the Lord. Then we have Lot's children, the children that were born out of incest in the cave, you know, Ishmael as well, when, when you know, Sarah and, and, and um, her husband Abraham wanted to help God, and we see the situation there with, with Hagar and the Ishmaelites, and all these things matter, and they bring problems in the future. And it wasn't any different here with uh, Esau and the Edomites. So we were in verse uh, 40, 41. So Esau hated Jacob. Notice that. He hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. In other words, as soon as my father dies, I'm going to kill my brother. He didn't know that his father was going to live at least another 43 years. So it's going to be a... A lot of days of mourning. It's going to be a long time before he would ever get to it. 
if he was going to be faithful to his word here. Verse 42 says, And the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. Maybe some servants overheard this. So she sent and called Jacob, her son, younger son, and said to him, Surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. Now therefore, my son, the third time she says, Obey my voice. That's the reason he got into this whole mess. But she says, Obey my voice. Arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran. And stay with him a few days. These few days would turn into 20 years until your brother's fury turns away. In verse 45, it says, Until your brother's anger turns away from you and he forgets what you have done to him, then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereaved also of you both in one day? And I think uh, you know, what she was referring to here by being bereaved of both is, well, if, one, if Esau killed Jacob, well, one's gone already, but naturally, the other one would be exiled. I go back to you know uh, Cain and Abel. He was exiled as well. So she would lose both of her children in, in this fight. Now, last week, we didn't cover verses 34 to 35 of chapter 26 because I wanted to leave it for, for this week. So we're going to read chapter 26, verses 34 to 35, and then go back to verse 46 here where we're about to finish. So look at chapter 26. And they are years apart. Keep that in mind. It's years apart. But they are all talking about the same thing here. About um, Esau's um, habit of choosing marrying the, the wrong women. It says, When Esau was 40 years old, he took as wives Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. Why were they a grief of mind? Well, because these were... Women of, uh, you know, Canaanite women. These were pagan women that probably brought in, you know, they came with the false gods. They came with all the idolatry, and they brought it in there. They weren't godly women. They didn't believe in the God of Abraham. So they were a grief, and that can be a grief if you're unequally yoked, if you marry somebody that doesn't believe in Jesus. It's a grief. Look at verse 46 now, last verse of chapter 27. And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth, the Hittites here, if Jacob takes the wife of the daughters of Heth, like these who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? So now, she wanted her son, obviously, to find a, a, a wife from her land, from her hometown, just like she was brought by the messenger. I think it's uh, Genesis chapter 24. Abraham devotes a lot of time to bringing, finding a wife, a bride for his son, Isaac, he doesn't just, oh, marry one of the little, just, you know, walk into the, one of the Canaanite bars and find yourself a girl. You have your pick. Isaac, he doesn't do that. He, he sends a messenger, his trusty messenger, to go find her, his trusty servant, and he brings her back. But see, Esau didn't do that. He settled. He settled for less. He settled for just any girl. But here, Rebecca has a concern for her son. I think this was a secondary concern. I think her main concern was to protect him, as we already read, from his brother's... Um, rage from his brother's revenge here. So what can we learn from this family? You know, the, the Bible d records everything. It's, it's, it's partially a history book, book as well. It recur records uh, the, the mighty acts of faith, but it also records the times that, 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 you know, when Abraham messed up, when Isaac messed up. What should we learn from this family? Let's, let's start with Isaac. Number one, we started off by talking about how Isaac thought he, you know, he's ready to kick the bucket. He thought, I'm going to die any day, any day now. So he's got his one item bucket list, and that is, you know, I want to eat some tasty, savory food for my son before I die, and then I'll bless him. That's what he thought. He was being moved out of worry. He was being moved out of, uh, out of fear. He thought, well, I'm going to die. I'm getting old. I'm going blind um, as well. And I think a lot of the times we can move out of fear. We can make hasty decisions Wrong decisions when we are moving out of fear. You know, well, my brother, he's 137 already. He passed away at that age. So then I, I better start planning. And I understand planning isn't bad, but when we move out of fear and worry instead of faith and wait, waiting, we deceive ourselves. You know, we deceive ourselves. We don't have to go physically, be going physically blind to be deceived. And we can save ourselves a lot of grief, a lot of pain, a lot of stress. When we uh, are moved by worry and fear, as Christians, we, we know that the just shall live by faith. We are to walk by faith and not by sight. 
Our second point is this. We should not trust our emotional feelings in spiritual matters. And this is in reference to him and his appetite for savory food. This is in reference to him and really being led by his favoritism for his son, for his son Esau. He was moved because he, 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 he favored the older kid. And we see Isaac here as a picture of, of somewhat of a, a, of a of the flesh. Somewhat of a picture of the flesh because he was moved by his senses. Okay, He was moved by his sense of touch, right? He wanted to touch his son. He was moved by his sense of smell. He was moved by his sense of taste, his appetite. And that's a picture of the flesh. He was not moved by... We, we don't read in this chapter that he sought the Lord, that he built an altar, he, he offered a burning sacrifice or... or, or, or um, or sacrifice for the Lord. We didn't do that. We don't read about this here. And that's because it doesn't happen. But he does. He is moved by his feelings. And it's been said, you know, feelings are okay passengers, but they're terrible drivers. Right? You don't want to be moved by your feelings. Feelings can be deceptive. Feelings can be deceivers. They are. We should be moved by faith. We should be moved by God's word. Whether you feel like it or not. Jesus didn't say, you know, uh, um, he, he didn't say, you know, follow me if you, if you feel like it. He didn't say, love your neighbor as yourself if you feel like it. No. He said, actually, he said, deny yourself. And I think that includes your feelings, right? Deny yourself. Deny yourself and follow me. Our third point is this. When we lack vision, we are vulnerable to deception. You see that? See, Isaac wasn't just going physically blind. He was somewhat spiritually blind in a sense because he... He, I think he believed already. He understood that, you know, God's word was already said. The older shall serve the younger. Remember, see, the blessing, the person that has the birthright, that's where the Messiah would come. The Messiah would be born through that line. And we got here Esau that doesn't care about the spiritual things. I think he was just in it for the material blessings. And, and we see here that he lacks in that. He didn't care about the spiritual things. And I think Isaac didn't care that, you know, his word from his wife that the Lord had told her, hey, the older shall serve the younger. And we as men, we, we can't be deceived by our feelings. We've got to always seek the word of the Lord. Look at Rebecca. You know, in the previous chapter, we saw that Rebecca was a woman of prayer. She's having trouble. In her, there's trouble in the womb. What does she do? She seeks the Lord right away. She prays. The Lord answers her prayer. I don't know if the pain went away right away or till you know she, she, she after the birth, but the Lord answered her prayer. Now we see a woman that is not necessarily seeking the Lord's will, but she's seeking her own will. I mean, she she knows the outcome. She knows what the Lord is gonna you know the Lord had already given her that word, but now she's trying to do it by her own strength. She's trying to do it in a sinful way. Notice how many times she said, "Obey my voice." She was taking matters into her own hands. She was going about things the wrong way. She lacked this trust in God, even though God had declared Jacob as the, as the one. Another point is this. Whenever we attempt to achieve something God said he would do, we had trouble where no trouble was needed. You see that? We had trouble where no trouble was needed. You know, if the Lord has given you a word and he's going to bless you or whatnot, Get out of God's way. Many times in the church, people, you know, many pastors, and, they, I, and I, I've had these temptations where, you know, okay, let, let's pragmatize here. Let's do this, and let's start, you know, having these, uh, I don't know, gimmicks or whatnot to bring people in, to fill in chairs and whatnot. But if the Lord, in, is, if the Lord is not in it, it's, he's not going to bless it. And if, you, if, if, if people are coming because of you, then you've got to sustain them here. You've got to continue to perform and continue to strive to gain so you can strive to maintain. And that's not how God wants things to be done in his church. It's his church. He keeps adding to the church. They, those who would be getting saved. And God does the adding. So we see here, she was trying to secure the blessing by her own strength. And she, she was plotting. And it's not bad to make plans, guys. We just got to make sure that our plans are aligned with God's will and God's word. Look at Proverbs 19.21. Out of the New Living, it says, You can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. Proverbs 69 says, We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Life is a lot easier when we get out of the Lord's way and we allow His plans to be fulfilled in our life. 
you know, G- following Jesus, you know, I, I mean, I understand things are hard. Things can get hard. Things can get hard in the ministry. Things can get hard in, in your marriage with your children. But Jesus said, you know, and I believe this. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 30, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Bob, you want to show that picture of the, of the yoke there with the oxen? And that was a yoke, basically, you know, like in basically the, 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 the oxen's steering wheel there. The yoke was used to get the oxen, for the oxen to stay together, but to move together and to move in the right direction. The farmer would be the one leading them. And really, when Je- now, now look at Jesus here when he says this, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What is, what is a yoke? Let me give you a definition here. This is from the Oxford Dictionary. A wooden cross piece that is fastened over the necks of two animals and attached to the plow or cart that they are to pull. And I think what Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying, Let me, allow me to be the driver of your life. And things are much easier if you just allow God to direct your steps. If you allow God, you know, God's will to be done in your life and not do things on your own. It's not by, by brains or brawn. It's not by your intellect. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Let's look at Jacob here. What can we learn from Jacob? Well, don't lie, right? Don't lie. Don't deceive. We can learn a little bit more uh, from him. It's interesting, though, when he was, the first action we see about Jacob is he's holding on. He's a supplanter there. He's holding on to his brother's heel there, right from the the get-go there, out of the womb. But also the first words recorded about Jacob are that, are, sell me your birthright. So we see what Jacob was about. He lived up to his name. But notice also these, these characteristics that he had here with his lies. Num- verse 19, he was being a hypocrite there. Verse 20, he was deceptive. Verse 24, he was committing theft there. So do you see that? You know, when you lie, you got to use another lie to cover up that lie. And I know you probably heard that many times before. But it's true. You hear because it's true. You tell one lie and you want to continue to be deceitful. You're going to have to tell another lie to cover that lie. And that's not the way for the believer. That's not the way, you know, for anyone. Notice in verse 12 what what his concern was. And I think this applies to a lot of people. Verse 12 says, perhaps my father, this is when he was, I don't know if he was backing out or he was just, you know, trying to make sure they plan everything correctly. Verse 12 says, perhaps my father will feel me and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him. Notice that I shall seem to be a deceiver to him. He wasn't worried so much about his character as much as, as his reputation. He wasn't, he says, I can get this done, but I don't want to get caught. And, and a lot of us are like that. Somebody once said, reputation is what others think of us. Character is what God knows of us. In other words, character is what you really are, and reputation is what people think of you. I'm a little bit like that. You know, we, we, we care what people think about us. Sometimes we move based upon what people think of us. But if we are, are being moved by what people think of, of us instead of what God thinks of us or knows of us, then there's a problem, right? And we need to set ourselves correct, position ourselves correctly, have the right view. Our, our third, fourth point here is if our satisfaction lies in being people pleasers instead of pleasing God, we will never be pleased. You're not going to find your value there. Okay? You're always going to be disappointed. And you're always going to come short because there's always going to be somebody that, out there that doesn't like you that you're not going to meet up to their standards. And you're always going to be striving if you're the people pleaser type of a person. But see, God wants you to please Him. You know, it's about pleasing the Lord. It's about obeying His Word. So we shouldn't be concerned about trying to please everyone instead of pleasing the one that is the Lord. See, because when we stand before God, He's not going to say, well done, my good and faithful teacher. Well done, my good and faithful usher. Well done, my good and faithful pastor. What else? Well done, my good and faithful daughter, brother, father. He's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant, because it goes back to serving the Lord. It goes back to serving Him. And I love, you know, this verse where, where uh, several times it happens, but in the, at the baptism of Jesus, where the, the Father says, this is my Son with whom I am well pleased. The Father was well pleased with the Son. Let's continue here. What else can we learn from Jacob? He was under bad company, his mother. Keep in mind, he was in his 70s. He didn't, you know, he wasn't forced here by his mom. He was a willful participant here. 
But we see that his mother is basically influencing him to, influencing him to do sin. The Bible tells us that bad company corrupts good habits. One translation says bad company corrupts good morals. You know? So really, there's a lot of influences out there. Sometimes we brush it off and we say, well, I can listen to whatever I want. But music influences you. And it's, a, it's sort of like a commercial. It, uh, the more repetitions they can get out there, the, you know, the better. Let's say, you know, I'm, uh, I don't need insurance right now. I don't need car insurance. But let's say, uh, I know as I'm, as I'm listening to commercials or whatever, the commercial that I listen to the most or that pops out the most, when I do need car insurance, that one's going to be in my mind for some reason because it's been going through my mind all those times every time I'm trying to watch a YouTube video or, or whatnot when I'm watching TV. So, yeah, it works. It, and, and it influences you. Your influ what you watch, what you listen to, the people you hang out with. So be careful, right? Because a lot of times we think we're going to change others and they're going to be pulling us down. They're going to be pulling us down and influencing us in a negative way. But here the specific thing is the mother was having a bad influence on her son. And that can happen a lot if, you, you know, if you're married or whatnot. I remember one time when my wife and I were deciding to homeschool. The Lord had specifically told us, you know, I want you to homeschool your kids. And uh, it wasn't something brought up by ourselves. It was... It was one of those, you know, it was a God thing. The Lord has spoken to us through a series of messages from uh, Xavier Reese. That's uh, Raul Reese's brother. So my wife called him, uh, called the pastor there, and uh, he called us back. And, uh, and I was talking to him over the phone, and she talked to, talked to him over the phone, and they were talking about, because see, my wife was having some issues with, with her mom, where her mom's like, well, why, why are you homeschooling? You know, you got to take advantage of, uh, you know, you got free... Uh, free education and, 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 you know, free lunches and all that. And you get free time. You can work or go to the gym or whatever. Follow through on your um, series or whatnot. And, uh, and he told me, you know, he says, you know, family's like a big circle. You, you know, in the middle you got Christ, but outside of that circle is everybody else. So you got your wife and you there and your children. Nobody goes into that circle unless it's by permission. So, you know, Bible tells us, you know, man shall leave his father and mother they shall depart, he shall depart from his mother. And that applies to ladies too. And they shall cleave and they shall become one flesh. So the influence that the father and mother had, in, had before when you weren't married is not the same as where you're married now. It's, you know, the, the husband and the wife should be making the decisions. It's not, it's not bad to get advice from your parents. It's a good thing, especially when it's godly advice. But it's got to be by permission. It's got to be consensual. I remember a while back before we see another time that the Lord spoke to me, and I'm sorry if I've told the story many times. I'm pretty sure there's at least two, three of you that don't know it. But back in 2005, we moved to uh, San Bernardino. I was working for Coke here. I was a merchandiser. So we moved to San Bernardino, and we were living with my wife's parents, and they had a two-story house. We were living in, in, a, in a mobile home here uh, with my mom, and, uh, and they, they, they bought a restaurant or whatnot, and, and they had a two-story house. So I went over there, and that's how I heard about Calvary Chapel. And... Um, and uh, exactly a year later, after I had already, you know, got my medical assistant degree and, and I was, uh, you know, I, I knew the word better, um, the Lord told us to go, told me to come back, that he was going to have a house for me here in Yuma. Well, my wife tells her dad this, right, that we're leaving, and her dad is like, he's like, you know, your husband's crazy. He's, uh, I'll pay for you to stay here. I'll pay for you to, you know, I'll pay your rent. I'll pay your schooling. Just, you know, just stay here. And the good thing is that she listened to me instead of her father's advice. And you know what? The Lord was faithful because it, wasn't only, it was just a matter of months till he gave us a house. He provided a house for us. And, you know, but we wouldn't have seen that if we would have just been influenced by you know, another person's opinion. And there are many stories, many, many times when people want to influence us in a certain way that is opposite than what the Lord is telling us. It might be good advice. It might be bad advice. But if it's not God's advice, get it out of your way. Joshua 24, 15 says, choose for yourselves, not your mom or your daddy, choose for yourselves whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And it goes back to that. It's a family thing. It's between a husband and wife. Notice uh, Esau. What can we learn from this guy? We're, we're with the last guy we're about to finish up here. We've already talked about how Esau was a picture of the flesh. He didn't care about the spiritual things. He didn't care that the Messiah would be, you know, whoever had the birthright, the Messiah would come through him. He, he cared about the material things. I, I'm just in it for the material things. And we see different hints in, throughout his life, the way he chose women. L look at uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 to 17. It's like a Holy Spirit commentary uh, on, on Esau. Just a brief thing that tells us a little bit about him. 
It says, Make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau, who traded his birthright as the firstborn son for a single meal. Notice these two characteristics. Immoral. One translation says sexually immoral or godless like Esau. Verse 17 says, You know that afterward when he wanted his father's blessing, he, re he was rejected. Not because he wanted, oh, I want Jesus to be born through my line. No, because he wanted the material things. He was a worldly man. It says, it was too late for repentance, even though he begged with bitter tears. I like this commentary from this guy named George Henderson. He says, he wept not because he was a sinner, but because he was a loser. That his tears were occasioned by the evil which sin brings, and not by the sin which brought the evil. So how can we learn? What, what can we take away? How can we not be like Esau. Number one, and I don't have these up here, I apologize. If you want to write them down, if not, it's fine with me. But number one, when we harbor unforgiveness or hate a brother or sister in our heart. And what did Jesus say about that? Okay, how not to be like, like Esau here. You know, when you, when you see Esau hated his brother and so much so he wanted to kill him. Jesus equated hating someone in your heart, a brother specifically, with, with murder. Similarly, when he said about, you know, lusting, uh, when you look at a woman with lust, that was equatable to adultery in the heart. And here we see him doing that. And his intentions were to murder him. See, it was premeditative stuff. He was waiting for his father to die, though. But if you have a problem with your brother or sister, the Bible tells us, hey, don't worship. Leave your, your offering at the altar and go, fix, you go reconcile with your brother or sister. And it's very true, you know, when... Some, one thing I do, and we've had, you know, we've had to learn. I didn't know this before. I mean, they don't, I don't think they teach you this in ministry, seminary. Maybe Tim can let you know if they do. Tim's in seminary. But uh, you don't want to preach and you don't want to teach when you're fighting with your wife, when there's a problem with another brother or sister. You want to solve that, okay? You want to solve that before because I don't think God is going to bless it. When there's strife, when there's harbor, uh, when you're hating someone, when you're harboring a unforgiveness, you know, the Bible tells us forgive because you have been forgiven. And I think it usually hurts the person that is holding on to that. You got to let it go and let God deal with those things. Now, the, here's the disclaimer, though. The Bible does tell, I think it's in Luke, where it says, you know, if your brother sins against you, you know, let him know. If, uh, if he repents, you forgive him. Okay, you release him of that. So I'm not saying, hey, somebody hurt you out there and you're going to go up to them and tell them I forgive you even though they didn't tell you they weren't sorry. I'm not saying to do that. But you do want to forgive them before the Lord. You don't want to hold any resentments. Just like Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They weren't asking for forgiveness. But he, he wasn't about to die with, uh, with any hate. He, he, he had a forgiving heart. Number two, when we try to earn our way into our Father's heart. And when we see here with the... Uh, with this guy Esau, he was a man's man. And we talked about how he was a man, he was a wild man, he was a hairy man, he, he was probably well built. And Jacob, he's an, he's, a inside of, he's an in-home, indoors guy like me, you know. And we talked about how, you know, uh, Andrew, you know, he's a, he's a, he's, he likes to hunt, he likes to go camping. I'd rather, you know, I'd rather have a good book and uh, some coffee and stay home. So we're different people. And that's how they were. They were different guys. And, but, but see, Esau could earn his way. Esau could earn his way. He could live in the wild. He was like survivor man. I think the only, the only time during that famine is the only time he couldn't get uh, some game. He couldn't win any. He couldn't kill any animals. But really, he's a picture of someone that tries, you know, to, to earn, to earn things. Because remember, I think it was a bad habit there where um, a, uh, Isaac blessed him because of the food he was bringing him. That's a bad habit to... To start with their kids. We've got to be loving with our kids with open arms all the time. It's sort of like the, the prodigal son's brother syndrome, right? We think, well, he's good. He's fine. He didn't, he didn't leave the house. But we see in his heart after the prodigal son comes back, he doesn't even want to go inside and celebrate. Why? Because he, was, he, he didn't agree with that. He didn't say, like, how can you, you know, he was probably thinking, hey, you should put him out there to work. You should put, make him be a servant. But he was out there working, and maybe he thought, well, I'm working, you know, I'm earning my way here. And that's not a way to look at things either. Galatians 3.3 3 says, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, or are you now being made perfect by the flesh? I like how the New Living puts it. How foolish can you be after starting your Christian lives in the Spirit? Why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? You've got to understand that. You know, that 
The Bible tells us, work out your salvation with trembling and fear. You, you need to obey the Lord. Okay? We need to obey. There needs to be works. Baptism should be the first work that happens after salvation, but baptism doesn't save you. Okay? It's by grace through faith, not by works, so no one can boast. But at the same time, during our walk with the Lord, we can think, well, I'm, I can polish my halo a little bit more than yours if I'm doing these things that you're not doing. So we've got to be careful with that. We've got to make sure we remember it's by grace through faith, not by works. At the same time, continuing to follow the Lord and yielding our spirits to Him. Last, last point, last thing here. Number three, when we neglect the Lord in our lives, then cry about the consequences of it. When we neglect the Lord in our lives, then we're crying about the consequences. How many of you guys know somebody like that? Maybe you were someone like that, right? Where we are neglecting the spiritual things. We're not going to church. We're not praying. We're not seeking God. But then when something bad happens to us, we cry about it. Lord, where were you? We blame God, right? That's a common thing. We do it all the time. I remember a while back, this young lady, she was out partying in, in California. And her daughter got a toxic shock syndrome. And, and she died. She died in the hospital. Her heart went out for like over three minutes. And we were praying. And you know what? She, the, she came back. But she remained in the hospital for about a month. And she had other issues. She was in dialysis. And she was not fully out of the woods. But the mom finally found out what happened. And you know what? After that, she was crying. She was seeking God. She even made a profession of faith. A public profession of faith. She started going to church. She saw this girl in the elevator. She invited her to church. Just a total stranger. And you know what? Things seemed pretty good. But after her daughter got out of the hospital, after things started getting better, what happens? What usually happens with some people, right? They go back to the way they used to be. And you know what? The Bible says, you know, that there's a, there's a I'm paraphrasing here, but, you know, there's celebration in heaven when one, one sinner repents. And I'm excited when people come up and, and they pro make a profession for Christ. But you know what? What, ex what? what makes me more excited is when they're here, you know, a year from now. When they're still following the Lord two, three years from now, you know, because a lot of times those shallow professions, are, it's, not, it's not real, it's just a profession. Our last point, a public profession isn't a seasonal job, it's a lifetime profession, right? Is Jesus my Savior? Is he really my Lord and my Savior? Or am I, you know, being a shallow Christian, I'm just a nominal type of a person? Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you for uh, the examples that you give us of, the, of this family, Lord. No family is perfect, Lord. We know your grace, Lord. We know uh, that you love us. We thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for our sins, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for shedding your blood, Lord. Father, we ask that you forgive us for our sins, Lord. We ask that uh, you would help us to, to follow you, Lord. That you would help us to... Uh, Lord, if we're husbands here, Lord, we ask that, that, that we would be able to put you first in our lives, Lord, not to seek our, our own selfish ambitions, Lord, not to make decisions out of feelings like uh, Isaac was here, but to make decisions uh, after praying, after seeking your face and your will, and to include our wives as well, Lord, that our wives shouldn't be uh, eavesdropping, Lord. And uh, we pray, Lord, for our children. We pray, Lord, for, for the families here. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.